Okay, let's go ahead and begin with chapter 12. We left off in chapter 11 with Dara being brave enough to ask to work in Kung Siler's kitchen, and he agreed to let her work there. So now let's see what happens. Will she find her family this chapter? Let's hope so. Okay, here we go. Chapter 12 of The Clay Marble. The next day, I was kept busy in the kitchen with chores assigned to me by the cook. All morning, I scrubbed pots so thickly and crusted with soot that my arms were aching long before I was through. Then, after a brief break for lunch, I was told to peel a huge basket piled high with garlic. Only when dinner was quietly simmering on the rows of stoves that I had a quiet moment to myself. Taking a plate of rice and stew the cook had ladled out for me, I retreated to a corner of the kitchen where the cook had had me sleep the night before. Shanae had promised me that he would spend the day looking around for my family, and I had been waiting impatiently for him to bring me news, but there had been no sign of him. I had finished almost all the rice on my plate before I noticed that the monkey was watching me, its bright black-rimmed eyes unblinking. Taking a handful of rice, I offered it to the monkey. It did not move. Well, go on, take it, I said. I won't hurt you if you won't hurt me. I tossed the rice at the monkey. It edged forward, its chain clinking behind it. It snatched up the lump of rice, skittered back into the shadows before eating. I laughed. You know, I don't mind what you did to us last night, I said, glad to have somebody to talk to. In fact, I guess I should be grateful. Otherwise, I wouldn't be eating so well. The monkey cocked its head, as if listening intently. I haven't had much to eat for days now, I said. You know how it is. If you don't have a family, nobody bothers to feed you. I tossed another lump of rice at the monkey, closer this time. The little monkey came forward and ate it right there without retreating to its corner. I wonder how you lost your family. You look like you need a mother yourself. You're just a baby, really, aren't you? I had seen how baby monkeys clung on to their mother's fur as a mother swung from tree to tree in forests. Did you fall off one day and get lost? Or did some soldier shoot your mother and bring you back here? It, <clears throat> it crept even closer, and I held out the last bit of my rice. Poor thing, you're all alone now, aren't you? The monkey came up to me and took the rice from my hand. Its paw was leathery and padded. As it daintily ate the rice, I reached out and stroked its furry wrist. The shadows lengthened in the night, and still Shanae did not come. Only when it was pitch dark and the full moon had risen above the tallest sugar palm tree did he finally show up. Before he would tell me anything, he nagged me into getting him a plate of leftover rice. I slipped into the kitchen storage room and got some rice and pork rind for him. I didn't find them yet, but I think they're definitely here, Shanae said, crunching noisily on his pork rind. I found out there's a whole other section on the northern edge of the base camp that we never explored. They're probably there. So you'll look there tomorrow? I asked. Why should I? They're your family, Shanae scowled. And for a moment, he seemed like the mean, tough bully who used to smash our toys. I hesitated, biting my lips. Please? I asked Annie. There will be pork and basil leaf for dinner tomorrow night. Shanae smiled, and his face softened. Fine. I'll keep looking if you'll keep feeding me, he said. I considered this for a while and then nodded. That sounded like a good idea, I said, and then picking up his empty plate, I went back into the kitchen for another helping of rice for him. After that, so promptly would Shanae show up for his dinner every night that I suspected he had been waiting in the shadows for some time. I would sneak him out the bowl full of food that I had kept aside, and we would talk as he ate, but he never had any news to report. On the third evening, I refused to give him any food. How do I even know you're really even searching for them? I demanded. You could have just fooled around all day and then come here for free dinner. Shanae took a look at me and turned away. If that's the way you feel, I might as well leave right now, he said quietly. There was none of the bluff and swagger in his voice that I had seen in him before, only a kind of disappointment. Without another word, he started walking away. Wait, don't go, I said, pulling him back to his usual spot under the palm tree. I'll get you dinner. What do you want? Cabbage stew or salted fish? Both, 
he said promptly and sat down. I was at the square all day, Shanae said as he spooned some cabbage into his mouth, watching the new recruits practice marching around the flagpole. There are thousands of newly recruited soldiers due to swear allegiance to the Khmer Sarai flag. I hear all sorts of ministers and officials have been invited too, and there will be a huge banquet after the flag raising ceremony. Why do I care about some stupid ceremony? I said, I just want to find my family. That's why I was at the square, Shanae said patiently. With everybody standing around watching the drills, I thought I might spot your mother there. And I thought if Sarun was one of those recruits, I might spot him too. Well, did you? Shanae paused dramatically. I thought I saw your brother, or somebody who looked like him, marching around the flagpole. You thought? Why didn't you make sure? Well, they were all marching by so fast, I couldn't catch up with them, Shanae said. But I'll go back tomorrow and look again. I took a deep breath. Are you just making this up, I demanded, or do you really think you saw Sarun? I wouldn't lie to you, he said, not even for cabbage stew and salted fish every night. The next day, I could not keep my mind on my chores in the kitchen. It took me twice as long to scrub the pots because I would drift into a daydream about finding my family. And that afternoon, the cook had to yell at me three times before I heard him. When I hurried over to him, he was in a foul mood. Pay attention, he snapped. I don't know why I even bother with you, a skinny little orphan like you. He glowered at me. I'm not an orphan, I said. Well, you are little, and you sure are skinny, but I guess I need all the help I can get. Well, don't just stand there, child. Let's go. Impatiently, he beckoned me to follow him out of the kitchen. Obediently, I trailed after him as he walked out of the kitchen and down a narrow path past Kung Siler's quarters. We crossed the bamboo bridge over the trench. The path widened and then opened out toward a parade grounds. People were bustling about, hammering planks to make a large wooden platform for a stage. Loudspeakers had been strapped onto the palm trees, and marching songs were being played over the air. Hundreds of women and ragged children stood at the edge of the parade ground, gazing at the soldiers. Marching in elaborate formations around the flagpole were the soldiers. Dressed in the dappled green of jungle fatigues, they looked deadly serious each with a gleaming rifle jutted from his shoulder. Quickly, I scanned their faces. They seemed so grim and fierce that I was almost afraid of finding Sarun among them. What are you standing there for? Hurry up, I don't have all day, the cook snapped. He walked on ahead, skirting around the square toward the path on the opposite side. It's hard enough beating the general and his staff, he grumbled, walking so quickly that I had to run just to keep up with them. Now I'm supposed to feed the new recruits too? Just, just because their rice rations have run out, I have to get more rice for them? Where are we going? I asked. He ignored me and kept on walking. I followed him to the opposite side of the square. It was quieter here, and the spectators seemed to be confined to the other side. The cook veered off and headed toward a low-thatched shed that looked as if it had been hastily built. As I approached, I instantly recognized the sound that was coming from the shed. It was rice being pounded. Dum de dum dum de dum, the steady rhythm of wooden poles pounding at mortars of unhusked rice grains was something I had grown up with and always liked. In the midst of this army camp, against the background of marching songs and loud military orders, the pounding sounded reassuringly familiar. I remembered the clever toy mobile that John too had made with the dolls of two village women pounding rice. Playing with the toy had reminded me of home and made me happy. Now with the pounding of real rice husking in the shed, how much closer I felt to home. I looked up at the cook expectantly. Do you want me to help pound rice? I asked him. Just winnow it here. He picked up a round rotten tr rattan tray by the side of the shed and handed it to me. You know how, don't you? I nodded and took the rattan tray from him. This would be more fun than scrubbing pots, I thought. I had always liked flicking the full trays of rice grain, watching the white grain and brown husks fly up into the air and catching the heavier grains as they rained down. We walked into the shed and I saw six women in pairs inside. Each woman held a thick wooden pole and would pound a mortar filled with rice as her partner lifted her pole and waited her turn. It was dim and dusty with the powdery rice bran, but the air was fragrant and warm. Along the back wall of the shed were stacks of bulging gunny sacks. 
The cook guided me over to a corner and pointed to a mound of rice that had already been pounded. The brown husk split off from the white grain inside. I knew what I was expected to do. Scooping up the whole grain from the mound into my tray, I started tossing the rice up and forcing the lighter rice husks out, up and out of my tray. It had been a long time since I had winnowed rice, and I enjoyed doing it again. The cook watched me for a minute and nodded in approval before turning away to leave. Just then, one of the women lifted one of the gunny sacks of rice grain and heaved it over her shoulder. As she started to pour the rice into an empty mortar, I caught a glimpse of the bag. Stenciled in green ink were the words, rice seed. I stared, rice seed. Seeds of the high yielding, long grained rice variety that Sarun had so cherished. What these women were pounding in the shed was no ordinary unhusked rice, but rice of a special variety, carefully bred and treated so that each grain clean and whole would germinate in the fields back home. I dropped my rattan tray and ran after the cook. Wait, I said, catching up with him. They shouldn't be doing this. The cook glared at me but said nothing. I tugged at his sleeve. It's a waste, I cried. They're destroying rice that's meant to be planted, not eaten. Why don't they just use regular rice? We run out of it, child. With all these new recruits joining up, we use up our supply of milled rice, and the next distribution of it won't be until after the flag raising. I took a deep breath. But, but it's wrong, I cried. This is rice for farmers to plant, not for soldiers to eat. Oh, be quiet, the cook snapped. Just take a look out there. Roughly, he pulled me to the door and gestured outside. What do you see, farmers or soldiers, he demanded. I looked. Through the narrow doorway, I could see the dusty square filled with row after precise row of soldiers standing at attention, their guns held stiffly against their shoulders. Well, child, his voice was gentler now, almost sad. You see anybody who's going to plant your precious rice seed? A dozen soldiers marched smartly up to the flagpole, and at some barked command, fired off their guns into the air. The gunfire resonated through the hot, dusty afternoon. I felt as if something had been torn from me, and I ached with the loss of it. Blindly, I pushed past him and stumbled into the bright sunlight. No, I thought, not the rice seed, too. That's meant for us, for the women and children, for the harvest next year, for our new lives. Each rice seed, I thought, if it was carefully sown and transplanted, carefully watered and harvested, would yield 50 grains of new rice. And now, the same kind of rice seed was being pounded and crushed to feed these men, farmers who had practically overnight turned into soldiers. It didn't make sense, I thought. None of it made any sense. I had reached the edge of the square, and a contingent of soldiers marched past me, saluting smartly at the flagpole in front of them. I looked down at my hand. Still cupped in my palm were some broken rice grains, the brown husks stripped off by the pounding, to expose the delicate white grain inside. None of these rice grains would sprout or grow into tall stalks heavy with plump new rice grains. I remember my brother's face, how flushed with hope and wonder it was when he had shown me that first handful of rice seed as we approached the border. With rice seed like that, Sarun had said, we could really return to our home in Cambodia and start our lives there. A soldier marching by bumped against me and knocked the rice out of my hand. I stood back and watched his boots tread the bits of rice in the sand. When I looked up again, the soldier had marched past. Another soldier marched by me, and another, and another. A seemingly endless series of faces flashed past. Then I saw Saroon, his eyes straight ahead, his mouth set in a grim line. He marched right by me. Saroon! I tried to call out to him, but nothing but a hoarse rasp came out. In step with all the other soldiers, Saroon kept right on marching. In another instant, he had turned sharply, and he was soon lost to view among the spectators on the other side of the square. Stunned, I stood rooted to the spot. Could I have imagined it all? But no, that soldier was my brother. Abruptly, I ran along the edge of the square, trying to catch up with him. Soon I was engulfed in the crowd of onlookers on the other side. I tried to ram and elbow my way through them, but everyone was bigger and taller than I was, and I couldn't budge them. Saroon, I cried. Saroon, wait, Saroon. Ahead of me, I saw a narrow break in the crowd and began to make my way to it. Just as I was about to wriggle through, I felt someone grabbing my shoulder, pulling me back. 
I tried to shake the hand off, but it held on tight. Desperately, I tried to twist free, sobbing my brother's name. Then, as if in a dream, I heard someone calling my name. The voice was low and gentle and so full of love that I went limp. Slowly holding my breath, not daring to hope, I turned around. My mother opened her arms to me and drew me into them. She was big and warm and soft, and she smelled like wet earth after a rainstorm. She held me and rocked me back and forth, back and forth as if I were a baby again. And I pressed against her, warmth against warmth, and softness against softness. I could feel between us the hard brown lump of the magic marble. And that's the end of chapter 12. We will pick up with chapter 13 tomorrow. So as you can see, it looks like Dara found her mom and she saw Sarun as he was marching with the recruited soldiers. So now let's see, will they be able to find Baby and John Two next? That's what we're hoping for. All right, we'll pick up with chapter 13 tomorrow.